My guest today is Ivor Cummins. Biochemical engineering degree back in 1990, spent around 25 years in corporate. Especially after the first few years, I found my stride in complex problem solving, multi-factor, very complex uh, kind of problems. So I led teams for many years, became a manager, uh, managing directly teams of up to 20 engineers and worldwide teams up to 50 on major complex problems. So that was my whole career. Then I got bad blood test results around 10 years ago. Three doctors, including a professor, I questioned aggressively about these very high readings. What did they mean? Got very poor answers. So I spent a few weeks doing what I do in my day job. And I found out that we were lied to at an epic scale for, I don't know, probably 40 years. And I switched to a very low carb meat, fish and eggs diet. All my bloods got fantastic in nine weeks and I lost 35 pounds without even trying. And um, then I got into health. I got sponsored by a wealthy individual to travel around the world to lecture metabolic health, interviewed professors all over the world for years. And then when COVID came, I was obviously in a perfect position to realize immediately, this is ridiculous. This is like swine flu on steroids. So I got into COVID and then things got really rocky and you know, all the censorship, the abuse. Um, but, you know, I knew I was right. My worldwide expert network grew hugely to include immunologists, professors of immunology and uh, virology. So I leveraged my worldwide new network and to make sure that everything I said was bona fide. So you have huge followings both on YouTube and Twitter, for example, 230K on YouTube, 214K on Twitter. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, why Fat Emperor? You go by that uh, handle, Fat Emperor? What does that mean? That was early on when I discovered that the fat was not bad, natural real fats, obviously vegetable oils are poisonous. Um, but I discovered all about the cholesterol. I realized that the researchers for decades, they knew something was seriously wrong with, with the narrative, but they couldn't say anything because the whole business gone that way. So there was an element of the emperor's new clothes by Christian Anderson. So that was one metaphor for the emperor uh, and the clothes. The other was the emperor signifying corporate power and pharma power that kept the nonsense alive. And the third one was the poor fat emperor, an image of an obese diabetic person who is actually told to eat carbohydrates and vegetable oils, thus sealing their fate. So it's kind of a triple metaphor. Excellent. I, as uh, I said before we hit record, I've been consuming your content for just the last 24 hours and it's, uh, it's great stuff. I've been watching on your YouTube channel, this interview you had with Matthias de Smet, the author of The Psychology of Totalitarianism. And that, that's one of the best interviews I've ever seen, I think. Excellent stuff. Do you want to talk about what he covered and what you learned from him? Yeah. Oh, no. Thanks for, for kind comments. Yeah, I actually called it uh, the most important interview I ever did out of hundreds because I realized it answered the major question people had, uh, rational, uh, scientific, thinking people, logical people, uh, a minority, sadly. But when COVID came through, a lot of people were saying, how is this happening? How is everyone falling for this? The Diamond Princess data alone from February 2020 answers the question. It's the severe flu equivalent, nothing more in many ways. And uh, Desmet, of course, had for many years been looking at the phenomenon of mass formation. And his book was stunning. I knew I had to interview him. And just to summarize mass for formation and to explain to people how the whole world can actually go mad, or most of it, um, he said there's a few key conditions. You have to have an anxiety in the population and a loneliness in the population. Now, this, this doesn't mean someone living on their own up a mountain, just an inherent psychological loneliness, which in modern world, you know, with the phones, the iPhones, the virtual, there's a human loneliness now that's actually uh, occurring. And also a lack of meaning making in life. And in the modern world, he noted that 60% of people in the survey declared that they had what you would call bullshit jobs, jobs that did not have inherent meaning like a carpenter building houses for people. That's largely gone, you know, let's be honest. And Theresa May had a minister, I think, for loneliness. And in the US, they declared a kind of uh, epidemic of loneliness. 
So we had this modern population that was primed to fall for a narrative, if injected, a narrative that would make them feel connected again to the collective of humanity. And this is really profound uh, group psychology stuff. It's like hypnosis. And you can then have what happened in the, uh, the witches in Salem, you know, the Salem witch trials, the Crusades, a 1930s Soviet and Germany, uh, so many mass formations in the past. Uh, but the modern world is primed for one, but we didn't have one injected into us yet. And then the COVID narrative was injected, and that's what crystallizes and causes the mass formation, a compelling narrative where our safety is at risk, but we can all work together to, to be safe. That's the most compelling thing to humans, a, a threat, a fear, and a solution that we can be safe. And essentially what happens then is all these lonely people, and we know there was around 30% of people who clung to COVID kind of nonsense, like, like their life depended on it. But all this loneliness and anxiety now had a target. The anxiety could be addressed because you now had something you could see to be anxious about, not just, you know, deep felt gen general anxiety. You could lock it onto the virus or the witches you know, or the Jews, it doesn't matter. It's always, you, you find a, a, an anxiety source, you lock onto it. And then your loneliness, as you take part in the fantasy, your loneliness appears to go away. Hundreds of millions of people's loneliness appears to go away because they now feel connected again, but they're not connected and their loneliness did not go, go away. It's an illusion. They are no longer connecting to real people one-on-one. -on -one. They didn't fix their loneliness by getting new friends and new relationships. They've connected rather to the collective, to the, the, the anonymous collective of humans all fighting together to, to fix the virus, to save granny. So it's a false sense of connectedness and that's why they become really zealous. And that's why a huge minority of people become absolutely nuts because they do not want to let go their newfound feeling of a solution in their lives, you know? So that's kind of my very brief summary. Hopefully I covered everything. That's mass formation. It's happened all through humanity. I gave many other examples, always the same mechanisms and it's powerful like hypnosis. You could, hypnosis focuses people's mind onto a point, onto a very specific thing and everything else blurs bit like the background of my uh, nice Canon camera. Everything else blurs away and you focus. That's what the narrative does when you create a mass formation. Everyone focuses and don't realize that it's absurd. We're meant to be helping granny and the elderly, but we're making them die alone. As Desmond said, in Europe, in many countries, if someone was, had an accident in the street and was in a severe state, you are not meant to help them unless you had medical equipment with you, right? Clearly absurd. And yet people don't see the absurdity because they're essentially hypnotized into the narrative. It's incredible stuff. I hope you'll agree. I do agree. I think the Smet said that people uh, want to be part of a collective heroic battle and they're craving ritual and sacrifice. And so the masks were part of the ritual and the ultimate yeah. ritual was taking the V. Uh, I, yes. I think he makes a lot of good points there. And he woke up to this stuff, I think, more uh, in 2017, uh, well before well before uh, COVID. He was ready when COVID hit, I think, because he uh, had already uh, researched some of this stuff. Uh, I thought it was just excellent. Um, he talked about what we're facing now is technocratic totalitarianism. And I'm going to uh, define those. Technocracy, a government or social system controlled by technicians, especially scientists and technical experts, and totalitarianism, a political system in which those in power have complete control and do not allow anyone to oppose them. Do you agree that's what we're facing here? Yeah, pretty much. It's a kind of a 70-year, mainly, uh, journey that's brought us to this point. The post-war onwards, a lot of NGOs, a lot of foundations, and the growth of the UN, the World Economic Forum, and many, many more have all become 
desirous or lusting after a properly managed technocratic society where everything is controlled, just like China. And many of these people have looked jealously at China for many decades because China is running the, their country like a corporation. It's fully organized from the CEO, Xi Ping, down through the VPs. It's all managed, organized. Nothing goes out of place and anything can be done. Any strategy can be deployed because totalitarianism, uh, the people can't really complain. Uh, they, they have no choice. Uh, I enjoyed seeing at the end of uh, Matthias's book, uh, special thanks go to Dr. Robert Malone for his continued efforts to bring my work to the attention of the Anglo-Saxon world. I was wondering, uh, that's the first place I ever heard of mass formation was when Dr. Malone started talking about it. So uh, it's all tied together, I think. Um, one of the first things that DeSmet says in his book is that he noticed that alternative voices were increasingly censored and suppressed, particularly in the context of the climate debate. And that's of a special interest to uh, many of my listeners because we come to it from a climate perspective and many of my listeners have been uh, censored in that uh, climate debate. And it sounds like uh, in reading your Twitter feed, you're active uh, on the climate front as well, correct? I, I am. I have yet to do my full deep, deep dive. I promised a few weeks ago when I released a stunning clip uh, of the Greenland and Antarctic ice cores showing that we've come out of a very long cooling period and now we're warming up again. But we only started looking at it just when we came through the inflection. So we have 160 years of data approximately. And that's just when we're beginning to warm. Moderately, it's going to take huge numbers of years to really go back up to the peak. But they started measuring at the right time. And uh, I've looked into a lot of other graphs and other people like what? What's up with that, I think, is a website with a lot of data. As you well know, I'm a data guy. I have no bias or minimal bias. Everyone has bias. I have utterly minimal bias after 25 years in complex problem solving. It was burnt out of me. I got burnt decades ago by being confirmation bias. It's gone as much as it can be from me and friends like Dr. Michael Leeds, who wrote Protein Power. He was an engineer, then a doctor. We discussed this at length. You've got to become ruthless. So anyone listening, I have no bias. I'm looking at the data and to be quite honest, I I'm shocked. Like cholesterol, like fat, and obviously like COVID, which was farcical, I am just shocked. There are some trends upwards, but as we say, we know there should be because of natural uh, cycles. And there is a greenhouse effect. Uh, Arrhenius in 1896 first postulated it, and he felt, I think, that the greenhouse effect of the CO2 we're releasing might help avoid uh, an ice age problem or a, a cold problem, because that's the problem for humans, is, is when it's too cold. I mean, they've inverted it. Um, but, but the amount that CO2 can raise it compared to natural, it's just ridiculous. The methane from cows is clearly political, and it's far squared. And... CO2's warming ability, even theoretically, when you get up to 300 and 400 ppm and beyond, there's a diminishing amount of warming it can, it can uh, achieve. There's a logarithmic flattening off. So we've already at 400 probably got as much as we're going to get, but there's no correlation with the temperature in any case. But... but even if CO2 was raising it somewhat, and the amount it's raising it has no impact, noteworthy, but the amount it's raising it by, if we double it now, it's only going to raise it a little bit more. The whole thing, I just... And the other key thing I'll finish on this, sorry, Tom, also uh, Dr. Jakob Nordengard, I discovered no, I... what he discovered to his horror 10 years ago. He was a ponytail, left-leaning uh, environmentalist uh, student, and he was so worried about peak oil and energy politics and the future of the planet that he researched it. He could not get the answers as to where the climate stuff came from, from the professors in Stockholm who were effectively climate professors. And he couldn't understand it. So he went himself and researched back. They only knew back to the IPCC in the 90s. They didn't even know the history of their own profession. 
So he went and he found out that the trail led directly and quite quickly within a couple of days straight back to Rockefeller Special Projects Fund in the 1950s. And that's another whole story. But essentially for people listening, climate disaster, although CO2 and warming was identified by Arrhenius, who was the good guy in the 1800s, the whole topic was exploited and identified as one that would be perfect for world government being consolidated into a totalitarian system. And it was. Uh, so pandemics they identified on the whiteboard, uh, climate disaster, financial disasters, and end of resources or end of oil, and terrorism. So they identified all the stuff. They didn't care about any of those things. They didn't care about terrorism. It's a joke to them. Um, and the financial crash, they always make huge profits during one. Um, and pandemics, they knew was nonsense. And climate, well, of course, they, they didn't care what the truth was. They were identified as strategies and then money poured in for many, many decades. And here we are. I'm glad you brought up uh, Jakob Nordengord. Um, I interviewed him once. You interviewed him twice. I really enjoyed the interviews uh, on your channel. Just fantastic stuff. I, I can't uh, can't recommend it enough. Um, then the, I wanted to bring up this uh, replication crisis in science. Um, Desmet wrote, there's a staggeringly high percentage of research papers, up to 85 percent in some fields, reached radically wrong conclusions. Well, he said that this uh, crisis was kind of playing out in the background. The public wasn't really aware of it. But then in, in the COVID case, it uh, played out in public. Um, he said it was just a continuation with COVID of the uh, crisis. But the difference this time is that the spectacle did not take place within academia, but openly in the public square. All the problems that had surfaced a decade prior now played out in the mass media in plain sight in front of the world. Many people could hardly believe their eyes and ears when they witnessed scientists at the highest levels contradicting themselves and their colleagues, making simple calculation and counting errors, being transparently influenced by financial interests, um, even openly admitting that they had deliberately misled the population. Do you have a comments on what he on what he observed there? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I speed read his book before I interviewed him, and. Um... Yeah, it was just, it resonated so much. And the only thing he avoided, and a lot of people criticized him for it, he would not call out how crucial the narrative was. He said the narrative was what triggered it. And he acknowledged there were lots of bad actors out there, influential, who do trigger and exploit these narratives. But they, they people wanted him to call them out more. But the beauty is, Desmet is crucially important in one aspect we discussed, and then Norbegard answers the question around the who. And my latest interview with Professor Richard um, Werner, who invented, of, who invented the quantitative easing concept, QE1 and QE2 in 1995, Ben Bernanke got his Nobel, he usurped it. Werner answers any remaining questions for me, and it's the role of the central banks over the last 60 years in all of this. So it's beautiful. But on the liars and the scientists, it's comical. I mean, Valensky came out covering her ass recently and said, well, we did know earlier on at the start that the vaccines wouldn't really affect transmission so much. She actually admitted it to go on the record. But at the time, she was saying, the virus stops, you know, you heard Fauci, the virus stops with you. It goes no further. So it was all fraud. I mean, there were useful idiots, Tom, for sure. Loads of academics who just went cuckoo mass formation and unwittingly uh, lied and cheated to drive a narrative they thought was real and important. But I mean, all the key leaders, of course, were utterly corrupt. So... Interesting you bring that up. You put together this clips video of uh, the, the the lies. The, uh, fantastic compilation video. You personally did the editing yourself and put that together? No, actually. And, and in the comment I credited, oh. I didn't know who it was at the time. I oh. thought it was just a Twitter video. But I think it's a guy called Orb, O-R-B. He's a comedian. And uh, I updated the YouTube and the Twitter with the link to his account and everything afterwards, around six hours later, people said, hey, that's Orb. 
And sure enough, Orb is written on the top right. But it was beautiful because he brought in his comedic voice at some points. Like he said, we're all going to die. So added into the mix were comedy pieces of narration. It just made it, I agree, a work of art. Yeah, I'm sorry. I missed that part. I just listened to it. I didn't actually watch what was on the screen, but excellent stuff. I'm going to put a link to it in the show notes here. I'll put a link to your DeSmith interview and uh, maybe to Nordengord uh, interviews from you too. It's all stuff that people should check out. Uh, DeSmith also talked about the incredibly important role of speaking out of people like you and maybe me speaking out against this stuff. Because if you don't, I hate to bring up this whole Nazi thing, but uh, that's where it leads. It's absolutely critical for all of us, I think, to push back everywhere I, I hopefully you agree with that. I think you've at a personal cost to yourself, you've been pushing back, right? Cause it's so important. Oh yeah. It's, it's just beyond pivotal. I mean, it just blows away everything else. People, I was in a science summit recently and people who, who had been kind of affected psychologically by the madness of COVID and what's going on now with CBDC, central bank digital currency and ID 2020 and Clearly, the bad guys have a massive grip, and it just makes people kind of very worried. And I simply said, all you can do as an individual, uh, most people against this, is create awareness. Because we are dependent on the people to push back. We cannot stop the ultra-wealthy organizations, the UN, the WEF. You know, that would be, you know, that would be silly to think that we can stop them. But if even 10% of people were aware of the content of my talks or of what you know, this thing would change hugely. And so I know people reject you. And I gave a little bit of extra advice. You're rejected by people and they say, oh, it sounds like a conspiracy theory. So I just said, the way to do it is raise an eyebrow, ask a question, refer to a published article or published paper. And say, well, actually, I I saw a paper on the lockdown, you know, just published. Yeah. And it clearly shows that it had almost no measurable effect. So at the very least, the guys put the world through absolute hell for nothing. So what kind of experts are they in retrospect? We know that's true now. It was, that was nonsense. And just try and be serious, but quiet. Because if you get passionate and angry to try and convince someone, they will reject you. If you say things to people that feel like conspiracy theorish and you're passionate about them, they will reject you. If you raise an eyebrow and make a sarcastic joke and refer to a publication, and there's many publications now, The Telegraph, The Spectator, mainstream publications have published a lot of the stuff about how COVID was insane. Find the articles, refer to them, and stay calm. And just say, this is very ominous that the world has got itself so messed up that we went through that for nothing. And what's, what's this about now with like ID 2020? No conspiracy theory, but it's all published and it's funded by, by Bill Gates and the Vaccine Alliance, by Microsoft, which is Bill Gates, and by Rockefeller Foundation. And we know those guys. I mean, the ID 2020 is funded pretty much by Bill Gates and Rockefeller. Does that not give you some cause for concern as to motives? Really? So these are the kinds of things you have to question and be cynical and appear very balanced. But finished with your point, Tom, awareness is the only thing we can do. And the only other thing we can do, as we discussed in the conference, is push back away from where they're going with globalization and unifying everything in totalitarianism. Go back to local, real world friends, local banking, you know, local food supply, local communities. We all need to do that as well. That won't fix the problem, but it's certainly something we should be doing regardless. Awareness is the big thing. I'm a big fan of Edward Dowd. I don't know if you are as well, but in late 2021, I just retweeted it. He had tweeted out the difference between conspiracy theory and reality is about a week now. It started off at like three or four or six months, and then it got down to a couple of months, and then with the later boosters, it got down to a week or two. You know, reports came out on, on failing efficacy. It's just comical. I mean, I said to Professor Werner, I just said, it's weird 
I used to be amused by conspiracy theories, you know, weird ones. And I even did a six point tool, like an engineering tool to test whether something is a conspiracy theory or very likely a conspiracy of interests, a confluence of interests and exploitation uh, from conversations that are not so well publicized, i.e. a true conspiracy. And I said it, it, it never gets them wrong. But the thing is now it's like all of the conspiracy theories have, have all turned out unsurprisingly to just be old fashioned conspiracies and guys 20, 30 years ago, we thought were nutters. You got to hand it to them. I thought they were nutters, but nearly everything they were saying is real and live now. So there you go ahead of their time. So it sounds like you got a chance to meet Nick Hudson. And he has a uh, video that went viral about how to recognize a scam. Can you, uh, can you remember what he said? I, I bet you can. Huh. Well, I think so, yeah. It's, it's a short version of my full conspiracy ID tool. And that uses uh, the criminology basis, uh, you know, motive means opportunity. And you have to put in the data, published data. You can never use hearsay. Any published data under motive means an opportunity you can enter. And then there's statistical probability and general probability. And then another key category that if this one fails, uh, it, it nearly carries a true conspiracy on its own. If you get propaganda repeating what we already know, right, consistently combined with censorship or suppressing dissent together, right, it is a conspiracy. And Nick, Nick was saying basically that if you hear that we have an issue that is a global issue and it requires, there is no other permissible solution, but a global solution that requires global control and more control. He said, then it is a scam, simply put. And he went on to elaborate and he gave examples, but he added in quite rightly, uh, when you see the science being quoted as a static thing rather than an always evolving debate, when it's the science consensus, you know it's a scam because science is always debated. There is no such thing. That's a lie. And then he added in as well the suppression of dissent. And to be honest, those three together, the global, uh, the science is settled, and any suppression of argument or dissent rather than, you know, drawing people out and saying you're wrong and pointing out why they're wrong, you get those together and uh, it is a scam. You don't need the minutia. You don't need to go through the data. You don't need to check out the modeling. And it usually will be modeling, right? Causing it. Um, it's a scam if those elements come together. And he's absolutely correct. And I'll send you a link to my template if people are interested. Yeah. It's just a, a more comprehensive version of what Nick said. One last thing, Tom, I actually tweeted that with very positive comments, that clip, and it came back to me a day or two later and said, wow. So I, I'm delighted oh. to have helped it become a more viral. It's beautiful. Uh, I'm glad you did that too. Um, I mentioned that you have these huge audiences on YouTube and Twitter. And do you have a sense as to how these people uh, found you? Or did they come for the uh, uh, diet and uh, uh, health uh, issues maybe and then stay for the rest of it? Or, or, or how do you think they got to you? I'm curious. Yeah, I've, I've wondered about that since way back. I think maybe half the audience is heavily COVID and, and around a half is older and heavily metabolic health. I think the low carb communities, because they'd been fooled on fat and cholesterol to the point of having diseases and have suffered greatly, they were fooled once. They didn't fall for COVID. So a lot of low carb people, and I went in, Mar in January this year to Denver for the first time in a couple of years to a low carb conference. My buddy and co-author, Dr. Gerber's big one in Denver. And I went on stage and introduced speakers, but... I didn't actually want to give a talk because it's a little too tense with COVID at the moment and it's a commercial conference that, and that's fine. But overwhelmingly, I was mobbed by people thanking me for what I'd done and most of them saying I couldn't really do it apologetically like my job. I'm a professor. I'm a doctor. I kind of couldn't really 
be loud about, which is fine. Everyone has their own scenario. So keto and carnivore, who are much more critical thinkers, harder core, even than low carb people, almost all of those uh, saw COVID from the start, right? So it's very interesting, the different groups. And the worst group in the universe or groups, you, you'll know this, I have a lot of connections in medicine. Doctors and the medical people fell hook, line, and sinker into screaming mass formation in general, and academics and upper middle class wealthy areas of Ireland and elsewhere fell for it, and corporate senior people probably pretended to fall for it, but a lot of corporate people I know who should know better, who were technical, they fell for it. They just could not believe inside that all the experts were wrong. How could that happen? So, it's yeah. Interesting that you bring that up. I don't know the exact quote from Richard Lindzen on the climate front, but it's something about educated people are uh, particularly vulnerable, that uh, it's yeah. harder to fool the ordinary people. And I think for most of these scams, that's what I'm seeing, that it's harder to fool people who have some connection to the real world and maybe academics uh, are, uh, they, they believe that the science is the truth. And I, I think that once people wake up, maybe that the science in any one area is complete baloney, then they uh, ask this question, what else are they lying to us about? Uh, I'm encouraged that uh, we're seeing that. How do you think the battle in general is going against this uh, mass formation thing? All right. mm, yeah, that's evolved over the last year or two. So a year or two ago, it was obviously, it was pretty catastrophic for us. And I was thinking, I'm a stoic. I'm severely a stoical. So whatever happens, I accept fate. So I don't get as despondent as a lot of people will do. Naturally, most humans really find it, you know, just very oppressive to know that the whole world is being gamed and it's heading to totalitarianism. But I, I, I just, I, I try to stay above that. But yeah, it was pretty bad a year and a half ago. But then, you know, when all the boosters came out and I saw that a load of engineers and managers and other people who got the two shots and kind of said, ah, well, you know, save granny, blah, blah, blah. When the boosters came out, they said, okay, what's this about? They, they smelt a rat and they didn't give their kids any vaccines. When in Ireland, they came after the kids, uh, very low take up really. And the boosters, uh, 60 something percent of medical staff didn't take the booster, which shocked the, uh, the establishment. So I think a lot of people woke up when it became clear that COVID was a scam. Uh, real virus, old people suffered, no problem with that, but a scam, let's be honest. And more and more are waking up. It's hard to say, Tom, is it critical mass? Not quite yet, but as they push more madness, more people will begin to say, hold on a minute, the conspiracy theorists seem to be right about everything. So it, they need to push their madness, but there is a danger. And that's why there's so much censorship still. Because if you didn't have censorship, the whole thing would collapse in flames. Final answer to your question, we discussed this in Amsterdam at length. And my view, most views there from the professors were very positive. Nordengard, and I know Corbett from the Corbett Report, and many others were saying this will not work. The modern awareness is too high. With time, they'll overreach, etc. They're pretty strongly confident. I kind of said I'm on the razor's edge where I spent most of my life. I'm on the razor's edge here. It is all to play for. Shoulder to the wheel. This is the battle of our lives for our children and our grandchildren. This is something to be roused about and not get despondent. It's all to play for. Absolutely, I think we can win. Probably will win, but I'm not quite as positive as some. But, but Tom... All to play for. Absolutely, if people rise up and awareness grows, this thing is going to collapse hard, I would say. Yeah, you mentioned all to play for, and you are a World War II buff, and uh, I, you could look at this as a, as important as uh, storming Omaha, don't you think, in the, in the big picture, if we let them uh, put us in our 15-minute cities and have this uh, dystopia? I think it is that important yeah. that we have to fight, yeah. Absolutely. And also the analogies of World War II. Yeah, I've watched thousands of hours of documentaries, et cetera, over the last many years ago, long before COVID. 
And uh, there were so many scenarios for people at an almost hopeless situation and they had grit, resolve, courage, and they, they prevailed. So that's one thing for, for everyone to, to hear here. And the other thing is, yeah, there's an element of increased tempo and an almost panicky race. So right now, like in certain times, many times in World War II, in battles or engagements, one side, the enemy, had to race to cut off. You know, like the Russians trying to come down to the Caucasus or when they encircled uh, Hitler's army in Stalingrad. But you're racing to cut off the enemy and get the upper hand. They are racing now for hate speech laws. They're using fantasy hate. That's not really a problem at all in the West. Uh, to justify censorship of climate and everything else. So they're racing to get in hate speech laws, censorship. You can see Biden's administration has gone utterly fruity nuts. And there's an element of panic. And their UN common agenda, which is as scary as anything in this universe for the past few hundred years, that was progressing, but they've delayed it a year. And they've begun to delay some milestones. People should be uh, aware of this. Because COVID with Omicron fizzled out earlier than expected, that was a major blow to them. COVID was meant to get another year plus of full nonsense, and they would have brought in all their laws and maybe even CBDCs. But COVID fizzled out because of Omicron, and we won't get into the technicalities of that, but it was a great shot in the arm for good people. Omicron saved our ass. And now they put back some of the stuff that they were going to rush in and probably in 23. So it just shows you like this is the battle of our lives or, and we have a lot of tailwinds and we have some headwinds, but razor's edge, bad guys are racing to cut us off at the pass and we're racing to get awareness to take them down. So uh, what do you think about uh, censorship online that Twitter has opened up? It seems like YouTube is kind of loosening up a little bit from my perspective. I don't know. And, um, you mentioned a detail about LinkedIn censorship that you've just found some detail about some, wasn't that you that uh, if a post got 60 shares or something, then it got censored? Can you share? What was that one? Well, that was an informal uh, thing. It's not a proof. You know, there's no peer reviewed published paper demonstrating that. But I had begun to notice since I was let back on that if I sent out something that's factual, but particularly annoying to, let's say, World Economic Forum or awkward, like climate uh, stuff, like Professor Plimar or Plinar, I think from Australia, a three minute clip. He was brilliant. And I noticed that when it got good traction, the axe would fall. And, but other ones that were just as juicy or even hotter, no question. If they didn't get much traction, they got around 15 or 20, you know, shares and, so many comments, they're still up there. So when it gets traction, it draws either an algorithm or it draws, potentially it draws complaints from people who are monitoring, you know, bad guys who are monitoring. But either way, uh, if you get traction on a really good clip that's 100% factual, uh, it'll get taken out and the appeal fails immediately. Oh no, no, misinformation policy. And it ain't COVID. It's climate now, climate. Interesting. So Very climate is the next big thing. And CBDCs, incredibly, a financial system monetary reset to CBDCs is already getting censored and fact-checked by Reuters. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to see that there's a conspiracy when the fact-checkers move straight to a monetary instrument. And they've even fact-checked and blocked cartoons. I'll give you one example, Tom. This is how bad it is and how you don't need to be a rocket scientist to know it's a conspiracy. There's a cartoon with a side profile of a guy and he's looking at CBDCs and all around him are control, China, potential social credit system, and all the other problems, all purchases tracked, everything traced, uh, you know, money that runs out after a period or can only right. be spent on certain things. All these mega problems with CBDCs are all around, but the person's eyesight is looking and it's through them all, you know, narrowly, and it says convenience. Uh, and the head is saying, 
oh, that sounds great, and missing everything. That got actually blocked on Facebook because Reuters fact-checked that cartoon. Incredible. Like, whatever about saying, oh, that could have killed Granny, that was medically dangerous, right? That's their excuse. It's bizarre, absurd, but that was COVID. But what about climate discussions? And what about CBDCs? How come they get censored? Because they're all the parts of the same scam. That's why. Simple. Very great stuff. We're nearing the end of the 45 minutes here. Is there anything that, uh, any other points you'd like to make or any other uh, people's work you want to point us at uh, before we go ahead and wrap up? Right. Well, I'd say um, you can provide the link, but Dr. Nordengard's website, he's recently not had his contract renewed. And as he told me in Stockholm, I met with him and his wife, beautiful people. We spent seven or eight hours with a meal and drinks with my wife there after I interviewed him in person. And he said, um, I have no choice. So yes, I lose my contract, but I have no choice. The future of our whole society depends on it. So in other words, I will continue because there is no choice and I agree with him. But his website and his books, he has his old publishing house and Rockefeller controlling the game, the English version. It's in hardback, beautiful book and PDF. So if people go there and support him, that's really important because he cracked the full story of where all of this came from. I mean, the man is just fantastic. So that's someone else. And um, my own stuff, you can still Google me, Ivor Cummins, and he'll hit my YouTube, Twitter, et cetera, very quickly. And one I might add, it's free now for years, but we made a movie with a pretty big budget on Kickstarter covidchroniclesmovie.com all one word covidchroniclesmovie.com you can't find it on Google and YouTube within a day of release it automatically gets you a strike if any part of the movie is uploaded on their algorithm so that's how good our movie was and it has aged Tom beautifully we were so careful we have four or five full professors as the experts we're careful not to be claiming and we were really careful to avoid the censor. But because it's so compelling, censor took it out immediately. Shocking. So uh, I'm curious, can we mention that? Or can you mention that uh, in the text of a YouTube video and that's okay? okay? Yes, what I do is I always put it up on the screen in big letters. That's no problem. But I, did, I was going to share a clip from it, two minutes long once. Now, I don't know if a clip will hit you. But I decided not to risk another strike just in case. Uh, and I didn't put in the three minute clip, but there's no problem putting the link in the description box, in the comments. It's just the movie itself was put on the register, just like they'd put, I don't know, a Hollywood movie on. If you upload it, it's stored on a, a, in a server and they say, ah, that's copyright. Well, our one is loaded up, say, ah, that's not allowed. It's too scientific and sensible. We can't allow that. That's a great reason for us to go to it and watch it, right? Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's good fun, I think, as well. It's an enjoyable trip for people now. It's only an hour and a bit long, and it's it says everything about COVID, really. And even the vaccine, because we were finishing it, I think it was in 21, we got to put in some really nice comments and predictions on the vaccine and the lockdown damage that would come like a freight train. So it's just aged like fine wine. It's, it's not big budget. It's two guys making a movie. But to watch it now, I'm just stunned. We pitched it perfectly. And it's, it's just great to watch now, I think. All right. So thank you very much for this conversation. I really enjoyed this. I appreciate you taking the time. No, thank you, Tom. And we'll circle back in a while more. We'll see how things are developing. That sounds fantastic. All right. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you next time. Ivor Cummins. Goodbye.